Grand Rising, my friends. Welcome back. And for those who are new, hello. We are getting near the end of the week, but we're still riding strong. I know everybody had good time since I saw you again. You you are growing, getting stronger and clearing your thoughts and more empowered in your intent to where you want to be, which now, you know, with synchronicity, start opening up the, the secrets of the universe and see where we at with it. Speaking of which, now this is, I spoke a little bit about this the other day, talking about the Havana Syndrome, and when it came up, we would talk about it somewhat, but we're not going to go too much in depth right now, but we're going to discuss it a little bit, because Vavavin, look at this, VP Kamala Harris, Vietnam trip delayed by possible case of, of Havana Syndrome. But they got the press coming in for somewhere. I don't know. Okay. Vice President Kamala Harris. Wait, I'm butchering her name. Kamala. I call it Kamala. Kamala Harris was delayed from traveling to Vietnam on Tuesday after her office was made aware of a possible case of the so-called Havana Syndrome, a mysterious illness that has affected U.S. diplomats across the world. A statement released by the State Department said Harris' office Sorry, Harris was made aware of a report of a recent possible anomalous health incident in Vietnam's capital of Hanoi, referring to what the U.S. government has previously described as Havana Syndrome, a string of unexplained health incidents first reported in 2016 by U.S. diplomats and embassy staff in Cuba. There have been cases in Moscow, China, and also Washington, D.C. in the Virginia area, if I'm not mistaken. NB NBC News reported at least two U.S. diplomats were medically evacuated from the country after people had experienced anomalous acoustic incidents over the weekend. So let's get to what the Havana syndrome is. They, you know, blah, blah, blah. What is it? We don't know exactly what, but here we go. Government officials and scientists are still unclear about what caused the symptoms, but a National Academies of Science report found directed pulsed radio frequency energy was the most plausible explanation. Cases have been suspected among intelligence officials, diplomats, and other U.S. personnel in Cuba, China, Europe, and the U.S., most of the people who have experienced Havana syndrome has an onset of a perceived loud noise, a sensation of intense pressure or vibration, nausea or headaches, according to the report. Now, I heard about it several years ago. I remember hearing about it. It was people saying they felt like it was almost in the sense of, and this is what it seemed to be, that people were using directed energy weapons or at least energy or radio waves to hit somebody and make them like almost completely disoriented and give them neurologic symptoms that persist after the they, they feel the attack when it happens it almost like like i said a tense pressure and sense but after the fact these people have had memory problems um personality changes physical problems and it was a big fight because the u.s government was kind of like I don't want to say pretending like it didn't exist, but, you know, downplaying it and, you know, chalking it up to other things. And it was like, no, nah, somebody is is attacking our uh, diplomats and our intelligence officers and, you know, in, in, in the United States as well. So this is um, this is something we got to keep it very close and, and get a sense of what the heck this the cyber attacks. Look, I live in America. And so. Yeah. I was like, what the heck is that? I live in America, and so, hey, look, I got to look out for me. <laughs> in a sense, you know, I'm not like, no, 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 I'm not one of those. I'm like, oh, no, I want where I'm at to do well. I want everybody everybody else can do as well. I, as you know, I, I believe in abundance, that there's plenty enough for everyone. But I'm not going to suffer just because other people think that they don't have and wonder why, you know, I'm 
we need to be of the mindset of, hey, there's a lot enough, there's enough for everybody. That's why I said, I, I see the world as abundance. It's not I'm fighting a scarcity, I'm fighting for this, this crap. No, uh, my creator created abundance. Speaking of which, exciting and terrifying. Co-founder of a $10 billion jobs web seek, website, Seek, says serious investors can no longer afford to ignore cryptocurrencies. Matt Rockman started his company alongside some buddies back in 1998. Said he has about 3% of his investment in crypto, using that as a hedge along with gold. Remember we talked about Palantir? The data maybe look like it's going to be some black swans coming. So they are putting their money into crypto and gold as well. A part of their uh, portfolio, which is smart for any investor. So he's just saying that a lot of big money people he's around are afraid because he's probably still in his. To me, it's probably like it's different levels of it. And so vast majority of people have no clue what's going on. There's people who are watching videos like this who have some understanding and trying to get even better with it. And then there are people who, you know, either inherited or were able to make money young enough to where they have a lot of money, but they still don't understand quite to do with it. But they are around people who have sense and probably a lot of them are getting taken advantage of. Then those people who are super rich, you know exactly what to do and move through it and watch these videos as well because, you know, <laughs> and so it's a lot of investors who have money but don't know and they just you know what they're being told by money managers and financial planners to do this and that and they just follow along they have so much that they money just keep growing so they think they're a genius um and so they you know they're they're terrified of cryptos it's a ponzi it's dangerous but he said <clears throat> that's what make these assets attractive so in his investment both excites and terrifies me as any good technology should this is a guy who's invested before in uh privately before it became public like uber canva and fiverr he likens the industry to the early stages of the internet when a technology was still finding its feet and tech stocks were booming be Despite some trepidation from traditional investors, the late 90s tech boom eventually burst in the dot-com crash. Mr. Rockman believes crypto will be similar game-changing technology and encourage serious investors to take time and understand it. I agree. I agree. So he's investing in, uh, in Gemini through Gemini, the exchange ran by the Winklevoss twins. And his investment is split between Bitcoin and Ethereum, though he admits to also spend some beer money on joke cryptocurrency. It ain't no joke no more. Dogecoin. Dogecoin. Like I said, hey, look, you could. Hey, I just wish when I first saw it, and I remember somebody I was trying to teach people about it, and they, none of them listened, but one guy was like, maybe I should get some Dogecoin. I was like, look here, boy. We ain't trying to about no Dogecoin. We're trying to get these Bitcoin as Ethereum. This several years ago. But now I should be like, we should have, because those coins was like hundreds of cents. Uh, but they would get some mess up. I mean, you know, hey. This is one of those ones that's heartbreaking, but at the same time, man, the calculations have to change. So I'm going to throw in one of them videos of how much you need of each of these coins that are big enough so you know where they kind of strive for it, but not because it's a lot less probably than you think, especially when you think of exponential growth. But this is one of those things that change the numbers up when you see something like this. Potentially lost Bitcoin in dormant wallets totals 34% of supply. And that's total supply, not even the supply that's on the streets now. The total amount of loss or long term held Bitcoin. That, and, we, and when they talk about long term, it's like somebody really had the 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 most ironness of iron hands, you know. The oof, the total amount of loss on long term held Bitcoin is said to now be close to thirty point four percent of the current supply of Bitcoin. Okay, let's see. Could they say seven million? You know. 
Well, let's see. On chain market analysis company Glassnode shows the total amount of long term Bitcoin Bitcoin holders or potentially lost Bitcoin has reached thirty three point nine six percent. The total amount is seven million one hundred thirty one thousand eighty four Bitcoin held in these wallets. Do it say when the on chain firm also recently highlighted the Bitcoin exchange outflows have returned to a dominance of outflows through August as investors withdraw BTC from exchanges. You see that when people are saying, hey, and this is what game theory. There's only a limited amount of it. And if you don't have some. You can't just go make new ones. Hope they make some new one. So. It's going to be worth. And so if a third of Bitcoin is either gone forever in a sense that there's somewhere that can't be retrieved by someone with the means that we have now or will be ever in a sense. Now, look, you know, this is quickly a quick, a quick step off into speculation land or just a second of that. We move off into quantum computing, and quantum computing can beat the Shasta 256 encryption that we have on Bitcoin presently. But there are algorithms and layers that can be added to Bitcoin to make it have quantum encryption, basically. But, like, buddy who got that zip drive that has his pass, his private key on it. But it's a password protected zip drive. He only has two tries left. Once he has quantum computing, he could break his zip drive or, you know, hard drive, detachable hard drive and get the password for his Bitcoin. So, you know, there's ways to go about it. But if you have no clue and don't have the, the password written or encoded somewhere, then your private key, then, you know, womp, womp, womp. So interesting, but so that's going to change the numbers in terms of how much Bitcoin you actually need to because there's far less than people are assuming when they're calculating this. And once they become certain how much it is, then, you know, that's going to be another leap up in, in its, uh, its value. The one that is able to be used, you know, people are using the market cap of Bitcoin, like every Bitcoin that is on the blockchain is um is potentially attainable by someone and they're not so once that is taken from the market as well of what is not there forever then the number becomes less than 21 million Swedish drug dealer bitcoin got 1.5 more valuable while he was in prison now the government is reimbursing them now this is like hey you got to give uh, Sweden, they, you know, they, 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 at least they some uh, straight shooters out here because they could have just, you know, said no, <laughs> went about their business. So the long and short of it is when he got arrested, they confiscated 36 big uh, bitcoins. No, 36 bitcoin were confiscated. I don't know why they said pet peeve. I guess it's because these individuals try to portray themselves as experts in this to other people and other people don't know and then they see that and they keep seeing it's equivalent to three bitcoins today they think this person knows what they're talking about and anyway so when his trial occurred each bitcoin is worth about three thousand seven hundred dollars and he had 36 of them and he you know they confiscate them and the prosecutor at the time argued that he should be stripped of it and that the monetary value, she said, and, you know, the cost of it, he has this Bitcoin is worth one hundred and thirty six thousand dollars and that should be taken from. And that was put in the record and she used the dollar amount, not how much Bitcoin he had. And we talked about this, I believe, yesterday that you be very careful about. The dollar versus in Bitcoin is more probably smarter just to keep your crypto because it can be worth way more in the future. And you're thinking about, oh, I already, you know, spent it at that time. And now it's, um, you know, I was reading a story about these MIT people who, a lot of them, they got like, I forgot what they got, but it was like not half a Bitcoin. This was years ago, like 2014, but like 
you know, whatever, a third of a Bitcoin, 0.25, but a good amount. And they, some people spent most of it at a little sushi restaurant or a noodle shop on the campus because they took Bitcoin. And, you know, hey, if you, A, you had to sign up to get it. And if you did, you know, some people kept it. Maybe, who knows? And some people spent it, but it is what it is. Anyway, so she, she argued with the dollar amount. And now he gets out and they got to split it up. And the, the, that 36 Bitcoin is now worth about 1.5 um, or even more than whatever it is today, you know, 36, five divided by five. I'm sorry, if it's 50, then it'd be about 1.8, but I think I'm right. 1.8, um, mil. And so they have to, um, give him the, the, give him back basically 33 Bitcoin because three of his Bitcoin is equivalent to about what she, you know, argued for of the. 136,000 in court. So the difference, which is about 33 Bitcoin, they got to return him his coins. <laughs> the drug dealer. And they even know it, saying we laminate. The lesson to be learned from this is to keep the value in Bitcoin, that the profit from the crime should, should be 36 Bitcoin, regardless of what value Bitcoin has at the time, Kohlberg said. It has led to consequences I was not able to foresee at the time. The prosecutor did add that this case was the first in the country's legal history that involved cryptocurrency seizure and therefore had no legal precedent set by previous decisions. So, you know, you live and learn and it just works out this guy, you know, did some time but got out and got his Bitcoin back. And he should be smart not sell it himself. But, you know, maybe he probably gonna do something stupid with it. Visa buys a crypto punk as it takes first steps into NFT commerce. Now, yeah, Visa is going deep in the, in the NFT world. They have a head of crypto, um, Kerr, Shetfield told the block. Payment technology company Visa announced Monday that it bought a crypto punk as it enters into the world of non-fungible token commerce. So CryptoPunks are considered the original NFTs created in 2017 by Larva Labs. Uh, these pixel art images each have their own personality. There are, I think, eight. I don't know how many of them. I mean, there, there are thousands of, you know, I think less than 10,000, but several thousand of these crypto punks. NFTs and Visa bought one for about 150,000. So there's several thousand. And they're selling for 150,000 per. <laughs> but they, so we felt that crypto punks would be a great addition to our collection of artifacts that can chart and celebrate the past, present, and future of commerce. Visa head of crypto told the block in an interview. Visa owns several pieces, vintage pieces related to commerce as part of its art collection. This is probably somewhere in their like world headquarters and such, including early paper credit cards and knuckle busters. They're not talking about brass knuckles, a device merchants use to record credit card transactions before the advent of electronic point of sale terminals. Why would they want to add crypto punk to their collection? He was asked to pioneer the NFT technology wave of NF NFT commerce. So Visa wanted to own a punk, one of the crypto punks. They worked with a company called Anchorage Digital to buy it. And Anchorage Digital will facilitate the transaction in, in the custody of the NFT for Visa. Saying that they bought it from Visa using Fiat. First partnered with Anchorage earlier this year to settle payments in the USD stablecoin on Ethereum. So Visa believes NFTs will play an important role in the future of commerce. Listen to that. This is not any type of advice. I don't, I don't have to say this every time. I don't have to say this every time. This is the first time watching these videos. Go watch another video. I'm not going to have to repeat about the advice thing. Just, just listen for entertainment purposes. Whatever you do is on you. 
Visibly, v- NFTs can help individual content creators and small and medium sized businesses in new ways. NFTs are an intersection of culture. This is all corporate talk and commerce. I'm trying to think of how they expect, maybe almost like your branding in the future. You, you have will be NFTs, you can sell off bits of your branding. We can envision a future where a crypto address becomes as important as your mailing address. I can, I can, I can see that. Definitely can see that. You got to be important about protecting it, or at least protecting who knows who. Um, your crypto address, the government may know, and the companies you're dealing with in terms of the exchanges may know who belongs, what entity belongs to that address. But for other people, you got to be smart about it. Interesting. So Visa is looking to to really pump out their um, NFT, understanding how they're going to play into commerce. So let's keep it close, very close. We know we know we keeping eyes on that. Boom. Disney reportedly considering purchase of Spider-Man rights or the film division from Sony. Just over the years, they talk about how Walt Disney and Sony have had some contention secondary to the fact that years ago when Marvel Comics was on the verge of bankruptcy, they sold off a lot of their film rights. Okay, what happened? In the 1990s, a near bankrupt Marvel, which was the comic book company, sold the rights, publishing company, sold the rights to a Spider-Man character to Sony Corps. Several other characters were sold to movie studios to bring in cash to the struggling comic book company. Not only did they sell Spider-Man, but the Spider-Man quote-unquote universe, which are other characters that kind of ride with Spider-Man, like his villain, his, his rogue gallery, Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Venom, Carnage and such, um, Morbius, but also the other characters like Black Cat, um, so, it, you know, Marvel, inside the Marvel Universe, they have, like, the X-Men stories that kind of characters who kind of weave in and out of their same um, stories a lot, as well as, like, the Avenger-type titles. They have more... And over the years, it's kind of morphed over time, so there's always going to be characters that, you know, sometimes that those Spider- Spider-Man have been members of the Fantastic Four, members of the Avengers... It's a you know famous stories of the X Men. He he uh, fighting the X Men because they wondered if he was a mutant or not. But you know and you know Firestar being part of. Okay, we're not gonna go into, but we can go deep dives and in, into in a lot of comic book lore as well. I I know a lot about the Marvel universe and the DC universe. <laughs> They're comic books at least, and the, you know the movies of course. Anyway. In 2009, Disney acquired Marvel for four billion and gained access to a huge library of characters. Since then, the entertainment giant has been able to turn out blockbuster movies, and Marvel turned out some blockbuster movies. Disney acquired it. Disney then also acquired Fox, 20th Century Fox, which had the X Men universe, which was sold to them by Marvel during that time, the Doc period. It's back in the 90s, man, when they started making these comic books where they would have like. 20 covers and foil and holograph it was just silly but at the time it was like we're gonna make we're gonna make a cover that is just the cover <laughs> so that kind of uh, hurt the the comic book industry back then just work on the story man the story is what people are there for but this is going to be so you know we talked about how much disney as a company, as a publicly traded company, market capitalization grew under its acquisition of 20th Century Fox. Some amongst other things, the streaming service, having the full access to Spidey like they want. Now, you got to remember, Spidey, Sony makes a lot of money with the video games. So this gonna, they got to, probably they're just talking about the film rights because Sony is not going to want to turn over. Sony makes a lot of money with the video game of Spider-Man. So I can't imagine they would want to give up the rights to that. But Disney owned the merchant uh merchandising rights for Spider-Man as is, you know, there's some movie merchandising merchandising rights, but like the general 
what to do with spider and so <clears throat> we can go deep on this they tried they they was going to kill off the x-men and the fantastic four in the marvel universe and the comic books not kill off but kind of just minimize because of the arguments between disney big and uh and and fox so that's why they started building up the inhumans and trying to make the humans seem like they were going to be important because they wanted they didn't want to I guess wait, uh, waste ink and paper on uh, properties that they didn't control in the movies, which is going to hurt the comic books. It's going to hurt the comic books. You got to focus on telling good stories with the library characters you have and then just build off that into the movies. That's what's been working so far. You know, they're doing a lot of trying to put what's in the movies into the comic books. That's that that wasn't the the blueprint for success before but you know who am i how ai will reshape software development and we're not gonna spend a lot of time with this kind of just open your mind and the eyes a little bit to where technology is going in terms of software development in the very near future and how that's going to start this acceleration process of innovation that we're here looking at and how to capitalize on in our way to create that generational wealth but remember the weight of generational wealth mm. are you ready for it the impact artificial intelligence will have on the digital universe should not be understated not since the development of the electrical grid have humans faced such a radical shift in their relationship to the natural world in other words artificial intelligence you'll be able to say hey create an You'll be able to talk out loud to your computer and say, hey, do me a favor, computer, computer, do me a favor, uh, create an app for me, Let, or help me create an app. I want to create an app where we, it takes the data from my health tracker, and the periods where it noticed that my heart rate is being raised and my conversation tone is not, it sends me a message to, to play a video to make me laugh, a meme to make me laugh. I'm just saying some nonsense. And it'll create that app. And then it'll, you'll say, hey, can you figure out how to, I can get this app uploaded onto the store to have it on my phone? And the and the and your AI assistants, the artificial intelligence will be able to help with all of these tasks. And that is the future we're going to soon. And also you can be like, oh, hey, Hey, that app we made is a little buggy. I'm getting some reports that people are saying that it's um it's it's buzzing too much. We wanna I wanna add in a a a, a shifting reminder in there. You can send updates through just talking to your um, artificial intelligence software assistant, software creator assistant, artificial artificial intelligence software creator software <laughs> I'm joking as I go out there. But you understand what I say. You have the ability to, for individuals who have no coding ability, will be able to start creating their own uh, programs and algorithms. Or, or assist. Do you really create it if the artificial intelligence creates it? The ethical decisions. But we'll start, well, you know, your brain's behind it, but it, you know, it's the producer. This could alter the way software is bought and sold with individuals getting the updates they need from AI rather than having to shell out more dollars for a generic new release from the developer. This is saying as, you know, broader democratization of software development to the point that virtually anyone can create new programs, no experience necessary. So this is something that we are not i'm not gonna say not ready for but it's going to really revolutionize the plethora of ideas that have been in the space so far because it's a lot of individuals who don't have the access to the or access to the time or the technology and are very creative individuals. And so when that ability is d democratized across the globe, and, and all of this stuff is, is tying in, you're gonna have 
these satellite constellations, low Earth orbit with very quick latency, these 3D print machines that are able to create, uh, you know, technological products at a much faster rate, which makes them cheaper, that which makes it to be able to pass, uh, to be able to be used by far more people within that I have the software as a service and I think it talks about how much yeah according to IDC the worldwide AI market is expected to top 341 billion dollars in 2021 and then blow past 500 billion by 2024 for an annual growth rate of 18.84 18.8 percent it should be noted, however, that fully 88% of this market will be in the form of software, about half from applications. So investment in artificial intelligence should probably be over at least a half a trillion dollar industry with about almost a 20% annual growth rate over the next several years. This is not advice, it's just things to think about. And it may this may be even be low balling expectations. But I'm not going to keep you all much longer. I love you. You love yourself. God loves us. And that's all that matters.